Buju, I'm Rita Karpanen, your host for Native Report, a series that highlights Indigenous voices from across Indian Country. On this episode of Native Report, we travel to the Black Hills of South Dakota to learn about a historical site making history, and we shed light on what kind of community-led resources are available on Pine Ridge Reservation. Plus, we learn what we can do to lead healthier lives and hear from our elders. All this and more coming up on Native Report. Production for Native Report is made possible by grants from the Blandin Foundation. The generous support from viewers like Jack and Sharon Kemp and viewers like you. Tucked in the Black Hills of South Dakota is a physical representation of the rich history of the Lakota people. The Crazy Horse Memorial is the world's largest mountain carving and is considered the eighth wonder of the world in progress. But Crazy Horse Memorial is much more than a carving. It is now a place where the indigenous community can come together to celebrate, remember, and even learn. The Native Report team got to speak with the first indigenous CEO to learn his plans on continuing the legacy. Crazy Horse Memorial proudly celebrates history and dreams with legends in life. In 1877, Crazy Horse goes to Fort Robinson, Nebraska for what he thinks are peace talks. As soon as he gets there, he figures out pretty quick he'd been lied to and misled again. He was there to be incarcerated. He resists incarceration and he was stabbed to death. Right before he was stabbed to death, hecklers in the crowd yelled out, hey Crazy Horse, where are your people's lands now? He simply points to the Black Hills and he says quietly, our people's lands are where our dead lie buried. That's the moment that inspired what you're looking at. Chief Henry Standing Bear is the first cousin of Crazy Horse, Tashunke Witko. And Chief, Chief Henry Standing Bear saw and realized that what Crazy Horse accomplished by protecting the women and children and, and the tribe from General George Armstrong Custer and the Seventh Cavalry, that he was a great hero. And so Chief Henry Standing Bear wanted to honor uh, Crazy Horse, but also he also realized that by having a mountain carving near where Mount Rushmore is here in the Black Hills, that into the future people will uh, never forget Native American cultures and traditions. He then wrote a letter to Korchak Jokowski asking him to come carve a mountain. My name is Whitney Rencounter II. I come from the Crow Creek Hunkpati Dakota Nation right here in Central South Dakota. And I am the Chief Executive Officer of Crazy Horse Memorial. When Chief Henry Standing Bearer and Korchak Jokowski and, and Ruth Jokowski, the founders of Crazy Horse Memorial, and early on when they started, they, they had the, their eye on the big picture, which this is a humanitarian project that was bigger than any founders, family, community, that uh, they created Crazy Horse Memorial Foundation a few years after the first blast here at Crazy Horse. There was not a lot of resources there except for this vision. So they had to really go through a, a difficult process in the early days because no one believed that this could actually transpire. I get asked a lot about funding. I want you to know it was just decided ages ago that this would be built for, by the people for the people. The government's tried to give us $10 million four different times. We always say no thank you. Right. 
This is built by the people for the people, and that's just the way it will always be. So the mission of Crazy Horse Memorial Foundation is to protect and preserve the culture, tradition, and living heritage of the North American Indians. And we have over 600 tribes across the nation that exist, and we've uh, developed a reputation of a safe place to protect and preserve the artifacts and also to display the beautiful art that exists. As people are attracted here from all over the world when they arrive, we have over 11,000 artifacts in our museum, the Indian Museum of North America. And people can learn and be inspired to learn more uh, because we, we know that uh, there's so many tribes and so many traditions that it's gonna take a, a lifetime to try to learn about all of them. However, at least to be inspired is a start. Another aspect is through our living heritage part of our uh, mission is we have singers, dancers, artists, uh, musicians uh, from all across the tribes that exist in North America. Now in 2011, Ruth created the uh, Indian University in North America two miles south of us. The universities, the first classes were in 2010 and it's a summer program called the 7th Gen uh, Summer University Program and we currently partner with Black Hill State University who allow the students to attain 12 college credits while attending our summer program. And uh, then we have a fall program in partnership with South Dakota State University and those students that attend the fall program uh, earn 15 college credits. It's like a study abroad. They're already enrolled in an institution, a college across the university across the nation, but they come to our fall program for, for a study abroad type of semester where they'll earn 15 college credits and a certificate in leadership and sustainability. The thing about our university program is it's not just a summer program and a fall program. The students actually, we coach and mentor them all the way until they finish their degrees. So that is a huge part of our mission is to uh, really promote Native American students in higher education. When you combine all of the functions of our organization, uh, we feel like it continues to advance our mission and it helps uh, inspire people to want to learn more after they visit Crazy Horse Memorial. We meet them where they are. We're not gonna tell them what to think or what to believe. We just feel like we wanna create a, a place, a safe place that um, will inspire and want people to do better. The story behind creating the Crazy Horse Memorial and the work being done to continue the vision is intricate and worth spending even more time looking into. If you'd like to learn more or begin planning your visit, please check out their website, crazyhorsememorial.org. Low-dose CT lung screening, or LDCT screening, is to screen for lung cancer in people who are at high risk and who don't have any symptoms. If detected at an early stage, the chances for cure are higher. By the time signs and symptoms develop, lung cancer is usually too far advanced to cure. Studies show LDCT screening reduces the risk of dying from lung cancer. There are specific criteria for screening for lung cancer. Usually screening is reserved for older adults who are at greatest risk. It is generally offered to smokers age 50 and older and for heavy smokers with at least a 20 pack year smoking history. This is how many packs of cigarettes per day times the number of years. This means one pack per day for 20 years, two packs per day for 10 years, or any combination that equals 20 pack years. Current smokers or those who have still smoked in the last 15 years are at higher risk for developing lung cancer. If someone has serious health problems or has poor lung function, they may not benefit from lung cancer screening and may be more likely to experience complications from follow-up tests than possible surgery. For the scan itself, you will lay on a long table that will slide into the CT scanner. The table passes through the machine initially to determine the starting point of the scan. You may be asked to hold your breath to get a clear picture of your lungs. The scan itself is quick and takes less than a minute. A radiologist will look at the images and send a report to your healthcare provider. LDCT screening is usually done annually and until the point at which you're unlikely to benefit from screening. 
This includes worsening health conditions that make you too frail to undergo lung cancer treatment. Talk to your healthcare provider about lung cancer screening if you're age 50 and older and if you're a heavy smoker or have a history of heavy smoking. If you don't fit those criteria, we can help you quit smoking. It's why we're here. And remember to call an elder. They've been waiting for your call. I'm Dr. Arnie Vineo, and this is Health Matters. We now take you to the Badlands of South Dakota, all the way to the Pine Ridge Reservation, home of the Lakota people. Many only know of Pine Ridge as the poorest reservation in the United States. With a staggering unemployment rate of 90% and median household income of $25,000. But the Pine Ridge community is more than just statistics and poverty. The Native Report team got an inside look at what life is like on the reservation and what kind of work is being done in partnership with the Pine Ridge community to better serve those who call it home. Friend of show, Julius Not Afraid, shows us around the reservation and shares more about the organization One Spirit. A little bit of uh, itinerary we got going on today. Uh, we will be traveling some miles in our destination to and from, whether it's here at Bam Brewer's Meat House, Charging a Buffalo, uh, to Okini Market. I want to say that's approximately 40 miles. Uh, 30 miles past that is the LNU Center. And then back to Wounded Knee is another uh, 50 miles. So we're here in the Slim Buttes uh, community on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. We are now about to enter the Charging Buffalo Meat House. This is Mr. Bam Brewer and company. Wonderful, wonderful place we have established uh, underneath the One Spirit program like we have a packed house here. Wonderful. One Spirit is a 501c3, uh, which is a charitable organization uh, recognized by uh, the federal government and by the tribal government here on the reservation uh, as a organization that's founded to support the efforts of the Native Americans to take care of their people in the best way that they feel is right for their for who they are. Uh, first of all, you know, when we first founded One Spirit, it was I had been working with a medicine man uh, on the Mattapanai Reservation in, in Virginia, and he told me about conditions on, on Pine Ridge. Uh, so I met with Lakota people, and one of the things they first said to me was, you know, our, we need food program, we need food here. It's known as a food desert, and we need something here. There's a lot of problems here with the cause of the food, lack of food, lack of nutritious food, uh, a lot of health problems, and a lot of diet-related health problems like diabetes is rampant, those kind of things. Uh, so our first job was to try to provide and to provide nutritious food to the people. And most importantly, we wanted somehow to get to the point of providing buffalo meat. And then when we went to looking at how we could be self-sufficient, we ended up thinking about the Buffalo House. And that came because Charles Brewer uh, was working with us distributing food, and he talked about having uh, buffalo meat for the people. And they had gotten away from that, but it, the feeling was that that was part of the diet that helped them be as healthy as they had been traditionally. So uh, our family raises buffalo. We've been doing it for over 20 years. I pretty much lost count of how many years we've been doing it, but. We approach it in a kind of a traditional way. We, we let them live off the land. I look at them all as my relative, my brother, and, and we, we, we take care of them. And, and we, j we just enjoy um, returning my family to the Buffalo Way. Now that we got a place to process Buffalo and other wild games, um, we, what I discovered was that some of our people don't eat it no more. Um, that's how far away from our culture we've come. So now we've, we've uh, kind of, we're trying to uh, even do things as far as cooking it to bring it back. When this building was built, it kind of mended a sacred circle of the Buffalo's life. That's, to me, that's the, the part of the, 
That comes from the heart there. That's the main reason why, well, we need it to fix. So our job is to also bring something to, in, that's within their culture, not to bring a factory and set it up on the reservation, but, but to bring the buffalo house and, and distribute buffalo meat. You know, not only to the people here, but when we reach USDA inspection, which is next year, uh, that we can distribute it across the, the U.S. in different states. But, you know, in addition to that, you've got to contribute to the economy, right? Uh, and people need jobs, and they need to be able to, com they need to have something to do, and something they're proud of. So we started the Okini Market. Okini is a, uh, is a Lakota word that means sharing material wealth. And so we started out first with a list of people. Uh, we had people who worked with us who uh, other people on the reservation could call and say, look, I don't have, I need, my child needs a coat or my child needs shoes or, or could I get a blankets or could I get something that I need in the house, those kind of things. And so we put them on a list, what we call the Okini list. And we had wonderful donors who, uh, who looked at that list and said, oh, I can buy this. And they bought it and they sent it to the family. As with food, it got to the point where we realized that, yeah, but they're not picking out their own. You know, it's nice, they get what they need, but they're not choosing, right? Uh, their child doesn't get to choose their coat or their shoes, you know, and, uh, and I'm sure your viewers know that if you, you try to put shoes or, or a coat on a child who doesn't like it, you're gonna hear about it. You know? But here, no, because it's very cold and the kids are gonna be happy that they're warm. But we didn't want them just to be able to be warm. We wanted them to be able to choose, to have the choice that all of us have, that we can go to a store and we could, we could find what we want. A lot of our people don't have reliable transportation or they live on a fixed income. And so here at the Okini Market, we are, like I said, centrally located and we're not an hour away, like some other places are an hour and a half away. To get from one side of the reservation to the other is about two and a half hours, almost three hours, depending on how fast you drive. <laughs> but it, so it's a, a large reservation and there isn't too much in between. And I wanna say like 90 to 95% of our products here are below ten dollars. I mean that's like the outfits we have up you can get all of it for less than I think fifteen dollars less than ten dollars so everything is really affordable. Um, we do offer some free stuff when we get some stuff in like I, I told Jerry right off that I refuse to sell food our pampers, our toiletry, our cleaning items. Those are basic necessities that everyone should have. And if we can get them and provide them to people, we're gonna do that. We're not gonna charge for that. What we wanna do is just be self-sustaining. We wanna be able to supply needed necessities to our people and still be able to pay the rent, pay the lights, get propane, and then make sure that our employees have an income as well. So we're not looking to make money. And that's why the stuff, we sell it at a very, very affordable price. We have, they usually contact Jerry. She's the contact information on the website and they can either email her and ask, what is it that you need? And she'll get a hold of me. And once I go through the shelves or go through boxes and say, oh, we need more kitchen supplies, more pots and pans, more home furnishings, stuff like that, then I can let her know. And then once they do that, we have the, either people can just ship it to us at our address here, or they can do the, there's a give back box labels to where shipping is paid for them. So the other thing though that's most concerning here is the youth. And there are various things about this youth. Look, as, as we know, there's, uh, there's addictions. Uh, there's addiction in parents. And when parents have addictions, children suffer, right? The parents suffer too. But so do the children and the community and everything, everybody around us. So in 2015, we opened the youth center here. We gave them the resources, they built it, and they opened the youth center. 
And really what a youth center is here is providing food, uh, uh, love, love and care, right, uh, for the kids. They can come in, they can play, they can eat, uh, they can have people, adult people, and look at other people around them who, who are going to be supportive of them, who could help them with school work, who could do whatever is these kids need. Uh, and they can get them places to do things that sort of broaden their hor horizon. I'm Ogwala Lakota from Pine Ridge Indian Reservation and I reside in the Medicine Root Districts. My everyday role with One Spirit it is never the same, um, but it's always with the intent of helping others and helping people with resources and getting the help that they, they need with whatever it may be that day. It could be um, food, it may be um, supplies and maybe pointing them in the direction of getting necessities, toiletries, clothes. And I am that person to help them get that, get that right away. I am also a go-to person for donors if they have those quick questions and want to know information about our reservation. I was just inter interested in what this program had to offer just because of the community relationship and I knew it could still be with kids, it could still be with the community, it could be with elders and I really found a passion for elders, I, like going out and visiting them um, and they're, they live out way in the country. I go and I make time to go sit with them, go have coffee with them and just hear their story. So I really have like a soft place in my heart to know their story and you know how why they still choose to live to live very humbly because I find humble grandparents and I just it's so warming to know that they could just live so grateful for what they have and they share what they have and they may not have much but they're so willing to share. Barbara Highpine is a an elder who was living in in very um, difficult situations in her house and her roof had caved in. Uh, Barbara's not the only person here under those circumstances. There are many like Barbara. And housing on the reservation is very scarce. Uh, one of the things I need to say is that housing here, there often are families who live 10 people in a three bedroom house because there's not enough housing here for that, for, the, for them, right? So it's not like we could say, oh, well, let's just go find Rip Barbara another house. Because of our affiliation uh, with uh, the people from Amish country that you've been meeting and the partnership that we form with people, not only individuals and companies, but with organizations from all over, uh, we were able to say, okay, let's, let's get her a house to live in because she can't live like that anymore. And I'm so grateful that Jerry decided to help me. Last year we had a bad cold, cold winter and our water pipes are busted. And so we were homeless for a while, my nephew and I, and we stayed, we stayed from relative to relative. And last year I almost froze. <laughs> Ice storm and all my animals perished. So we came home and been waiting for it. And I'm glad my dreams have come to a reality and that uh, this winter I'll, I'll be warm and happy. The house is now being built. I think it's being finished today and we're going to see the finishing touches on that house uh, and see her when she gets to go into her house, into her new place. Convection oven, microwave that'll sit in here. We got a table for you. We got a lift chair, um, and we're gonna be working on a refrigerator and stove for you. So this is a one bedroom, and Magna, I watch a lot. I 
She made it possible. Yes, she did. Yes, yes, yes she did. did. Mm. You blessed me more than I can. You blessed us all. You blessed us all. Mm -hmm. It's a huge resource to everybody. Not there's we lack in so many aspects where one spirit is there to well shoot one spirit is here for me to remember like we can do things but one spirit and jerry baker has this mindset is if you see it do it you can do it during our team's visit to pine ridge one thing was made clear one spirit strives to help the lakota people achieve happier healthier lives which reflects how remarkable and unique their history and culture is if you would like to help One Spirit fulfill their vision of self-sufficient and independent future, you can visit the One Spirit website, onespiritlakota.org. If you missed a show or want to catch up online, find us at nativereport.org, and don't forget to follow us on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram for behind the scene updates. Drop a comment on social media if you enjoyed the show. Thanks for spending time with your friends and neighbors from across Indian country. I'm Rita Carpenin. We'll see you next time on Native Report.